let's read a couple of verses. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. The word, of the, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. Interesting word. In the hand of the potter, so he made it again in another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Let me take you quickly to Isaiah 64, verses 8 and 9, and we'll look at it on the big screen. You are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all we are the works of your hands. And verse 9, do not be furious, O Lord. Nope. Go back, there you go. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we all are your people. Of all the imagery in the, in the Bible, metaphors and allegories and what have you, this is one of the simplest. He's the potter, we're the clay. But to the Jews during the, the Israelites during the days of Jeremiah, they were backslidden. Uh, they were doing iniquity and all kinds, of, all kinds of things. And the word marred means ruined or, or bent towards destruction or useless. How, do you, how many of you know God can take the useless and make it useful? God can take the marred and make it beautiful. I... Uh, I've never seen, I'll show you a video, a little short video in a moment, but I've never seen a real, a real potter do something magnificent with a, with a, with a piece of clay. But I remember <laughs> back in Watsonville, where my sisters and I went to Freedom, Freedom School the old, at the old airport back, in the, back 175 years ago, it seems like now, my Lord, that was way back in the day, that we had this ceramic class. And ceramic simply means pottery that's been baked and painted and all that. And uh, you know how schools have these little arts and crafts little things? So I decided, maybe the girls remember, I decided to make my grandpa an ashtray because he smoked a pipe. And I did this. I got the clay, and I, 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 tried, I tried my best. I'm not an artisan, but I tried my best. I remember using my thumb as, to make holders so he could lay his pipe in there. And, and we baked it, and then I painted it this ugly green, this mossy, I don't know why, kind of army green, and I gave it to him at Christmas, and I'll never, <laughs> I'm so proud of it, and I'll never forget when Grandpa opened it up, and he, and he, he just kind of stared at it, <laughs> and, and Grandma's kind of, what is it, Dad? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> I said, Grandpa, it's an ashtray for your pipe. Oh, you know, the funny thing is, I never saw it again after that night. <laughs> I always kind of, oh, I know why. Grandpa had a green, remember that green leather chair Grandpa had when he did? That he had an old green rocking chair in, in our little TV room in Watsonville, and I kind of thought it would match the chair. But there was already a glass, beautiful glass ashtray. And I don't know what Grandma did. Probably took a hammer to it and threw it away. But it was kind of fun making it. But let me show you how experts do it, and we'll talk about this. Now, this, girls, what do you call that when it's dough? What's, what's the term? It's called kneading, which is with a K. K-N-E-A-D-I-N-G, kneading. So why, why do potters spend so much time squeezing and kneading, even slicing, slapping the pieces together? I'll tell you why. Air bubbles. You have to get the air bubbles out of the clay. Why? I'll tell you why. Because if when you bake the object you're making, and there's still air bubbles, the air bubbles expand and blow up the pottery or blow up. So they spend a lot of time, and then they slap it on the spindle. Of course, back in the day, it was all foot operated. Actually, it was two wheels, smaller wheel engaged to the, to the bigger wheel. But watch, watch this guy. 
how just gently an ugly old piece of clay slowly becomes something useful. He keeps baptizing it. I like that. <laughs> now he's, yeah, amazing. Got to spin so fast. Now, now watch what he does with his fingers. Oh, he's making the grooves. Very nice. Very, uh, very gentle. Well, there you go. Now, let me show you, not this, but let me show you a beautiful a vase or a vase. Now, we've seen these, these things that can be, if it's from the Ming Dynasty, it could be millions and millions of dollars. But that thing, that thing right there, at one time was an ugly piece of clay. Now, let me show you some scriptures, how God can take something that is base, uh, mundane, uh, virtually useless and turn it into something beautiful because I'm looking at a whole bunch of you and every time I look in the mirror I'm looking at a lump of clay but inside is treasure inside is the Holy Spirit so let's walk through a few scriptures and then we'll talk a little bit then I have an illustration I'm not going to keep you very long this morning let's go let's go now to second Timothy Paul talking to young Timothy in chapter 2. Let's look at verse 20 and read a little bit. But in the great house, he's teaching Timothy some pastoral lessons here. But in, the, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some for honor or valuable, and some for dishonor or things you can throw away, if you will. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, the dishonor, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. So then he gets into things that bring dishonor. Flee youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Verse 26, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. One more, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel. If you remember Christmas Eve, if you were here, I talked about the great contradiction that God Almighty in his infinite wisdom and predestination determined in his own counsel to put himself inside human vessels with fallen nature. It's amazing. It's amazing that God would want to live in us after the fall. You know, I had a thought. We're called uh, our vessel, our flesh, a lump of clay, if you will. But think about Ad, the body of Adam. The body of Adam came from what? Came from the clay or the dirt, mud, what have you. Now, you know, you know it was Jesus. Now, we, we don't call him Jesus till he's human. So he was called the son before we had a human name to him. He was the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, or Elohim, the, the, the Godhead. Some, some people refer like the word Trinity, three in one. But everything you see that's tangible was made by Jesus. The Bible says that. By him, all things were made by him, for him, and through him. All things, all the planets, all the galaxies, 
Everything you see in this room was crafted by the Lord Jesus. Every animal was made by the Lord Jesus. The Father says it, Jesus does it, the Holy Spirit tells us why and how, to a certain degree. The Bible isn't all truth, but it's enough truth to get you and I to heaven and live a good life. But God knows a whole lot more than, than that's in that book. Are you following me? So, Jesus was, the one, Jesus was the one that built the body of Adam. He scooped up the clay and he built this body out of a lump of clay. But then he, he breathed in his nostrils, interesting, in his nostrils, and he became a living soul. But after the fall, man's flesh was marred. It's corrupted. And yet God still wanted to have fellowship with man so bad, if I may, that it's kind of like he ignores. He ignores that weakness that we all have called the flesh, which is bent towards all kinds of things unholy, if you will. Like I always say, the, your, your body is dressed up, nowhere to go. Your body's not going to heaven. Your body's not going to hell. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Your body's going to return from whence it came, the earth. So that's why your body wants to party like it's 2099. That's why your body, your body doesn't want to diet. Your body doesn't want to exercise because it knows it's not going to be judged. So that's why we have to discipline ourselves. Paul said, I, Paul said, I buffet my flesh. Now, a lot of people I know buffet their flesh. <laughs> it's spelt the same, just a little different pronunciation. <laughs> Are you following me a little bit? So in this, earthen, in this earthen vessel, as we shared Christmas Eve, is, is treasure. And the treasure is God himself. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he gets on to say, listen, we're hard pressed. We're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. I brought a little piece of clay. Actually, to be honest, if I may, I'll bring the rest of my notes down here. To be honest, uh, it's called Play-Doh. You ever buy your kids Play-Doh? And then like three, three weeks later, you find it everywhere. It's in their hair. It's in the... It's in the it's kind of fun to play with. I remember buying this for my kids, and I think I had more fun with it. You squeeze it hard enough, you can, you can it's amazing, it's amazing what you can make. Here's a donut. You want to try it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't smell that bad. It's amazing. It's amazing what you can do if you're skilled. Somebody like Larry Huggins, who's a, who's a sculptor, could take this and make something really clever out of it because he's gifted. There are people that are gifted with stuff like this and, and just like the potter and the things we saw there. But let me, let me just share this. I, I know Christians, that, that they, think, they think if there's any pressure, if there's anything going wrong in their life, uh, God must be mad at them or they're doing something wrong. And they jump off the spindle because they don't like the pressure. It's amazing how God does things and we give the devil credit. He molds us and makes us, and it's uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I don't go on them carnival rides. I don't go to Great America. I don't go to Magic Mountain. You spin me around twice, I'm going to throw up on somebody. <laughs> I don't know if my sister Juanita right here remembers her and Shirley, who lived across the street, took me to the Santa Cruz County Fair, and, and I got on the Tilt-A-Whirl, the Tilt-A-Whirl with them, and I think after about three tilts, I started throwing up, and I remember Shirley screaming because it was going everywhere, <laughs> and I could not control it. So Dickie Bernal, Richard William Bernal, Pastor Dick Bernal does not like spinning around. I get, so I, I don't like that feeling uh, in my inner ear of spinning, but yet I've learned how to stay on the spinning wheel of God. I've learned how to just gut it out and say, you know what, you know what, yeah, some things might be spinning out of control. It might feel like I'm being diced and sliced and, 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 and pulled apart and then slapped back together and kneaded and pulled apart again and slapped back together and, and thumb stuck here and thumb stuck there. And it's like, God, this better be you because I'm hanging in there. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I remember when I was going to Bible school, 
I was going to, Carla, how many hours? I worked six days a week, 10 hours a day, 20 hours of school. I got robbed. I got, I got uh, ice storms. I mean, I, I remember one day, I was like, what the, what the? I'm crazy. I left California. I left a beautiful job. I had a house. And now I'm, I, I'm living in a little, I got a pregnant wife and a, and a three-year-old, a three-year-old baby girl. And, 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 and I, I got these crazy people robbing me, put sticking guns in my face. And, and I'm at a grocery store. I'm making $3 an hour. I left a job making almost $20 an hour. And yet I didn't jump off the spindle. I didn't jump off the wheel. I knew, I knew. I knew I was where God wanted me, and I knew it was going to be hard, and I knew there was a price to pay, but I had just enough glimpse of the future that it's worth it. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the spindle. Just because times are hard, just because times are tough, it's God molding and shaping and putting more treasure in you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Maybe you read the book, Chicken Soup for the Soul. You'll remember the story. It was brought to my remembrance a few days ago, and I wanted to share it with you. About 300 years ago in Thailand, there was a, a monastery. There were these monks that had this 10-foot-tall, solid gold Buddha, today worth over $200 million. But these marauders were invading the land, and they knew they were coming. Village to village, town to town, burning, raping, killing everybody. And they couldn't move the Buddha. It was too heavy, of course. It had been there for years. So in their wisdom, they covered Buddha with 12 inches of clay, Pearl. Took them a while. 12 inches of clay, they covered Buddha. Well, the marauders came and unfortunately killed all the Siamese monks. And their secret died with them. Of course, they took a look at Buddha and just kept on keeping on because a 10-foot-tall clay Buddha isn't worth. 1950s, almost 300 years later, the country of Thailand, in a new infrastructure project, decided to build some freeways, highways, and one went right through the monastery and right through Buddha. And so they got together with the monks and gave them a beautiful piece of property and said, we will move Buddha for you. Well, now I've worked with cranes in, my, in the 60s and 70s when I was an iron worker. And cranes back in the 50s weren't as sophisticated as they are today with all the computer technology and all the stuff. Well, they dug under Buddha. <laughs> they strapped him. And the more they tried to move him, the more Buddha cracked. And, everybody's, and people were panicking. The monks were panicking, the, de the devout Buddhists like, no, 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 Buddha can't be cracked. And they didn't know what to do. And while they're trying to figure out what to do, like the worst typhoon in decades or years hit Thailand. Well, now Buddha's melting. So they're trying to protect Buddha with plastic and visqueen and, and cloth. Well, what happened was because of the torrential downpour and the wind and the elements, the, the, the cracks, oh, I hope some of you catch this, the cracks in the clay because of the movement and the power of the crane were only widened because of the rain. When the rain hit the cracks, it began to widen the cracks. Now, things are really looking bad. So late one night, after the rain subsided, a monk took a flashlight out there just with angst and desperation and worried about Buddha. And as he began to look into the cracks, something glittered back at him. And so he began to run his hand, remember, 12 inches. And he ran and got the monks, they got the authorities, and they pulled all the visqueen and they began to hose old Buddha down and let me show you what he looks like today in a museum in Bangkok. Ten feet tall, solid gold Buddha worth 200 plus million dollars in today's economy. What am I saying? I'm saying don't curse your crisis. Don't curse the cracks. Don't curse the storms. Because it's simply God trying to melt the clay 
trying to get rid because of the gold that's inside of you. Stand up, somebody. Stand up. Stand up, somebody. See, that's why God lets us go through because I'm looking at a few thousand people in the natural. I see your flesh. I see your clay. I see your mortal flesh body. I see, I see you, the you I recognize. But inside each and every person here that knows God is solid gold. A treasure, a heavenly treasure of gold. Symbolically speaking, of course. Jesus in the book of Revelation said, buy from me gold. Pure, buy from me gold. And that's why, that's why God lets us go through stuff. Watch now. In him we live and what? That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, the closer I get to Jesus, the more cracks in my flesh. I'm, 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 I'm persecuted. I'm perplexed. We're crushed on every side by God's design. That's how, the, that's how Paul became the great apostle. He went through hell to bring heaven to us. And that's why God will let you and I go through some hell. That's why God will let us go through some storms. Quit blaming the devil, what God's trying to do. God's trying to get the gold. My, my theme, the supernatural theme of 2018, Dick Brunel's theme is God, less clay, more gold. I want to see more gold, less of me, more of Jesus. I want to be a vessel. I want to be a vessel of honor and not a vessel of dishonor. Put your hand on your chest and say, gold, come forth. Gold, come forth. However, However and whatever, whatever, I'm going to allow the treasure that's inside me to be seen by the world. I'll be a vessel of honor and not dishonor in Jesus' name. You see, that's the... the, the I know sin is pleasurable. Of course it is. Or why, why, would, why would it have such a, a grab? Why would it have such temptation? Sin, sin brings sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever. It brings pleasure to the flesh, but only for a season, the Bible says. It, it, it's, it's, it's very short-lived. But see, the more we allow ourselves to sin, it's like another layer of clay. And then another layer of clay. And we can get so many layers, we forget there's gold inside us. And because we forget there's gold inside us, we don't want to come to church anymore. We don't want to serve God. We don't want to give to God. We don't want to talk about God. We don't want to watch Christian TV or we don't want to, we don't want to hear anything Christian. And, and, then, and then we get bitter and we get angry at the world and, and, and we, get, we get mad at people. We start criticizing preachers and churches. Why? Because we just keep layering more clay and more clay and more clay. And we get mad at God because he doesn't answer every prayer. Of course he doesn't. Thank God he doesn't answer every prayer. I prayed for some of the stupidest things. Thank God he doesn't answer every prayer. And my testimony is I've been through. I've, somebody said, you know, are, are you worried about going to hell? I said, I've been to hell. You, I've lived through hell. I said, no, 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 no. This is before I was saved. I said, no, I, I, know, I know what it's like to live on the, other, the wrong side of the ledger. But now, now... I want whatever, in fact, a friend of mine, Tom Tiemann, had a dream about me, and he called me yesterday. I've known Tom since 1982 when we met in India. He pastors at Fresno. He said, Dick, he said, I, I had a dream about you. He said, I know, I read about you in Charisma Magazine, you and Ron and John Gray and all that. And, and he said, I, he, said I'm, 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 he said, at first I was shocked, and then I got thinking about it. He goes, then that night I had a dream. And I saw you as an ambassador, as a statesman, as a mentor, as an author. I, I saw the best of your ministry being the next 10 years. I said, thank you, Tom, because that's what I'm preaching on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Lord, your treasure that's in us, let the clay melt and let the gold shine forth. Every head bowed, every eye closed because if you're not submitted to Christ, if you're not a child of God, then you're simply a two-dimensional creation and there is no treasure in you. And it is so simple, family. It is so simple to open the treasure chest and to say, God, fill it with your gold and your glory. 
And Christ through me will be the hope for many, many people. I'm writing a new book, and the new book is called You Are Somebody's Answer. Might be the most profound thing I'm ever going to write. There's people praying, you're the answer. There's people in trouble, you're the answer. You haven't met them yet, you don't even know them. Some of them you do. Christ in you is the hope of glory. When you and I help people, it brings God glory. When you and I, when you and I share the gospel and somebody is saved, it brings God glory. You are somebody's answer. God's just got to get you two together. And boy, he knows how to do that. Trust me. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're willing to turn your life over to God, if you're, if you're, if you're willing to fill your chest with treasure by inviting God into your life through his son, Jesus Christ, and the blessed Holy Spirit. Shoot your hand up right now. Don't even think about it. Shoot your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. In the balcony, that's me. I need God in my life. Listen, this is the first Sunday of a new year. Why go through another year without God? Why go through another day without God in your life? Why go through another moment without the blessed Holy Spirit in your life, helping you and caring for you and loving you? Yes, correcting you when we get off track and, and being sweet to you because he's the, he's the sweetest there is. And it's all because of Jesus who died for our sins. Once again, just throw your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I'm ready to turn my life. God bless you guys. God bless you. Several hands on the balcony I see up there. Look at me, everybody. Let's, come on, just welcome them. Put your hands together. Put your hands together. You know what? They may be a lump of clay, but this is what God's gonna start doing to them. He's going to start molding and shaping and making them vessels of honor. Let's pray with them, everybody. You ready? Father in heaven, come on. Father in heaven. Ready? Father in heaven. Thank you for sending Jesus for all of us and the whole world, including me. As of this very moment, on this first Sunday of this first month of this new year, in this church, with all these witnesses, I say this with my mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Savior. He's my God. And thank you, Father, for sending him to die for my sins. And from this day on, Holy Spirit, help me. Lead me and guide me into all your truth. And I'll do my very best to serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' holy name. Somebody say amen. 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 amen, amen, amen. Amen and amen.